Am I audible to you now? I think no one can hear me. Okay, okay. Now, now I am audible. All right. So yes, welcome, welcome back again. Uh, I am Shalini, and uh, we are here for the GDPR crash course. And uh, this will be a two hours free GDPR crash course, which uh, in which I am going to give you, uh, you know, short insights about GDPR, how GDPR works, and what are the articles in the GDPR. I have tried myself to cover a lot of provisions and a lot of articles uh, for the GDPR. So uh, yeah, uh, is my full screen is not visible because I have uh, turned on my full screen. Mm -hmm. uh, this is full screen only. I guess now. Is it full screen now? Oh, I don't know. Then what's the issue? It should have been there, like full screen. I think I am also visible, right? There is some issue. All right. I think now it shall be better, right? Uh, I'm just I'm just waiting for the final confirmation from my team that if I am also visible and the PPT is also visible. Uh, then we'll start. Yeah, so the slides are also changing, right? All right, then I, I got the perfect message from my team. Now I'm going to start. Sorry for the delay, guys. Sorry for the four minutes delay. Anyways, we are going to cover it in two hours. So hi, I am Shalini Garg and uh, I am presenting to you this GDPR crash course, which is a two hours live session, wherein I'll be uh, answering you your questions as well as I'll be, you know, getting you familiar with the GDPR articles. So first of all, uh, I'm thanking, I'm, I'm very thankful for the Minister of Security to give me this opportunity and uh, uh, please guys follow their page ministry of security and also follow my linkedin page if you have any doubts any um, if you want any clarification related to today's session or uh, related to any of my previous sessions uh, you can anyway you know just uh, i'm just a message away from you okay so yeah uh, i would uh, firstly like to introduce me uh, although it's been uh, it's my third time here uh, introducing with you all but still i am shalini and i am a privacy professional having experience in implementing privacy frameworks i also do offer consultancy services and uh, i am also a trainer myself wherein i am actually entering into the world of training of privacy gdpr ccpa and also moving towards information security in a while uh, 
So this is about me, and I hope so that we'll catch up on LinkedIn for uh, future, uh, you know, references and for future talks. So let's first start with this GDPR. What is GDPR, and why are we studying GDPR? Even why are we studying this privacy? So you know what happened? Uh, it basically started with Europe, and what happened now? that our privacy our personal data that means my name my mobile number my email id my pan card number my account number everything is you know very 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 sensitive data and we cannot expose our sensitive data to anyone and everyone but to do trades to understand the economy of the country to uh, you know move ahead with the economy we have to share our data we have to do trades with our country with extra, with uh, even with outside country we have to do the international trades so for that all of the data we have to exchange for example even if we are buying something from the mall we have to give our contact number to them and they'll send the messages to us so there shall be one regulation there shall be one law to protect the data of the people right because if it is not protected then you know the people who misuse the data they can misuse it to that extent that we cannot even imagine right even photographs videos are also misused you all know about it so that's why we are reading we are understanding and as a lawyers although this uh, webinar is very important for people who are working in international organizations they are this uh, webinar is very good for privacy professionals this webinar is also very good for students who wants to enter into privacy and also to each and every one who wants to know what is privacy that's it who wants to know what is actually happening within the world of privacy right so we are moving ahead i am actually covering the whole gdpr today in 2 hours so let's hope for the best and let's start it so yeah gdpr basically have 12 chapters and 99 articles in it followed by a lot of recitals a lot means 173 recitals are there okay so in two hours session i'll try to cover most of the aspect of the gdpr and if in case any doubts have, you know you are you have you are having any doubt you can just clarify it with me we are moving on starting with the general provisions of the gdpr so whenever any law whenever any regulation comes into place we have our subject matters and objectives it defines that okay what 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 is going to cover in that act and why this act has been come into place although i have already explained it to you but let's read it for the sake of law that article number 1 talks about the subject matter and objectives of the gdpr okay so what is the subject matter subject matter is us we bo we we everyone we natural person is the subject matter so basically gdpr protects the natural persons okay gdpr basically protects the fundamental rights and freedoms of the natural person the gdpr actually you know just recognizes this that okay we are persons and we have our natural we have our rights and freedoms into place and it also in the same time recognizes that the personal data shall be moved on freely within the european member states or within the outside country but at the same time it protects the fundamental rights and freedoms of natural person then what material scope talks about material scope is the article 2 of the gdpr so material scope is actually that what is covered in the gdpr and what type of processing is covered by the gdpr so gdpr actually covers the automatic processing whatever is being processed by automatic means means with the help of computer but also covers the processing which forms part of the filing system or intended to form uh, part of the filing system what it means it means that the filing system are actually the government files it is it does not say that any paper which is lying around in the office or any other paper which is lying around on the road will not covered by gdpr but if that paper is into the file of a company then the gdpr would be applicable so this is what it means by the filing system so for all, all automated processing gdpr will apply and for filing system the gdpr will also apply on what things gdpr does not apply gdpr does not apply on any activity which is purely for the domestic or personal purpose or it also does not apply to certain activities which are conducted by the legal legal enforcement agencies means government means union government 
Okay, so this is what material scopes talk about. Now we are moving towards the territorial scope. So GDPR is definitely not the Indian law. We are Indians. And I don't know if how many Indians and how many other countries people have been joined in, in this webinar. But yes, GDPR actually talks about Europe and European countries. So we will only study the territorial scope in terms of the Europe only. So article number three talks about the territorial scope of the GDPR, where the applicability followed is that this regulation is applied on the processing of personal data. If the controller and the processor who are in the EU means their establishment, their company's being establishment is in the EU. Regardless of where the processing takes place, it does not matter if the processing is being taken place in India, in any other country, but if the establishment of the controller or processor is in Europe, then the GDPR would applicable. Okay. Number second is that it also apply where the controller and processor is not established in the EU. But the data subject means to whom they are delivering the services, to whom they are offering the goods are in the European Union. Okay, So this regulation also applies to the processing of personal data of individuals who are residing in the European Union or who are in the Union. So only on two things the GDPR would be applicable here, which means that offering of goods or services to individual, if the controller or processor is offering the goods, or providing the services to the individual who are in the union, then the GDPR would apply. And otherwise, if they are monitoring the behavior of the individual, for example, the um, how monitoring of behavior does is uh, that uh, some company is tracking our uh, you know website search history. Or if we are entering into any website, then they are actually tracking that, okay, Shalini is watching only uh, female dresses, then okay, okay, she must be interested into that, that thing. So we'll show more ads about it. We'll show more companies who are offering good, good dresses to Shalini. So what they'll do, they'll just show me that ads. So if, uh, if a company is monitoring my behavior, then also the GDPR would be applicable if I am in the European Union. Now, the third thing is that this regulation is also applied where the person is established in the EU and the and uh, the the company the company or the controller or processor is established not in the European Union but where the member state law or any uh, public international law applies. So basically, what it what it means is that there are few member state law which is being recognized by the GDPR where the European Union Act where the GDPR would be applicable. Okay, so then the GDPR would also apply. I hope this clears you. Now we are moving towards the chapter number, uh, the article number four, which is definitions. Look, definitions are 26 definitions are provided in GDPR. We are going to cover it, but uh, very short because we have very less time. So personal data, definition of personal data. So any information which is related to identified or identifiable natural person. Natural person means you and me. Okay, Shalini is a natural person. So if my name is there, Shalini girl, then I am identified. Okay, but if my name is only Shalini, but there is some other identification measures which is attached to my name, means my phone number or my photograph, then I will become the identifiable natural person. Means I am not identified yet, but yes, I can be identified. Okay, so an identifiable person basically means that anyone which can be identified directly or indirectly by factors specified to their identity means if my if with my name my photograph or my phone number or my pan card number will be attached then i will become identifiable and then i'll become the personal data then my name will become the personal data okay so examples are like name identification number location or an online identifier means cookies ho gaya, and ip address of the of the person psychological genetic character of a person this all comes under the personal data now the next definition would be the processing processing very easy and you know it, it can apply to anywhere is means even touching the data means processing okay but the definition says like that that any operation performed on the personal data Anything performed on the personal data means if, if I am collecting the data, if I am recording the data, if I am organizing the data, if I am storing, adapting, if I am doing any alteration in the data means any changes in the data or retrieval of data or use disclosure, dissemination, you know, the list is very long. But in crux, if I can say that even touching of data will amount to processing and the GDPR would be applicable. 
I hope it's clear. Okay, now the next definition is restriction of processing. So restriction of processing means we'll read it in the GDPR that we are marking a company. We uh, While reading GDPR, think in the terms that you are a controller. You are a company who are determining the means and purpose. I'll tell you the definition of controller, but yes, think like a company while you are reading GDPR. So when a company is marking a data, a personal data, as that the data cannot be processed now, it is restricted. So that is what we call it as restriction of processing. So whenever we are marking any personal data that, okay, their processing would not be, uh, you know, doing in future unless and until the data subject himself or herself provides that, okay, you can now uh, process my data. Till then the data can, uh, data has to be restricted because in GDPR always think from the perspective of controller as well as data subject. So when you are the data subject, you should know that you are the uh, owner of the data. You know, you can do whatever with your data and you can order that, okay, delete my data, erase my data, restrict my data, and the data will be, uh, you know, uh, the company has to do as what you say. This is what it means. Now, the next definition is profiling. Profiling means any automatic processing of data which evaluates the personal aspects for example i'll give you a very good example that hr person and if anyone is uh, analyzing the economic situation or any uh, financial uh, situation of a person then also it amounts to profiling so anything which is automatic process they are doing on personal data then it will amount to profiling now we are moving towards the next definition, which is pseudonymization. Pseudonymization is very important. I know if a person is, you know, want to enter into this privacy field, have heard about this, uh, this very tough word, which is very tough to pronounce as well, which is known as pseudonymization. So pseudonymization is actually processing of personal data in such a way that it cannot be attributed or, you know, connected to that specific person without applying of any additional information. Pseudonymization is basically the security measure or the technical and organizational measure which is being undertaken by companies so that they can preserve the data for a very long period of time by applying security to that data. Okay, so, so that the information can be kept separately, which is subject to technical and organizational measure. Now, pseudonymization ensures that the personal data which is, uh, you know, we have uh, identified that personal data is not attributable or identified to the natural persons. So basically, pseudonymization is keeping the data in such a manner that the data cannot be attributed to a specific person without application of additional information. Now, filing system. Simple, structured set of personal data accessible by a specified criteria. So any structured set of data which we have kept into a file and we can access it by some specific criteria. It is known as filing system. Controller, very important. Any entity, natural person, or any um, uh, you know body corporate determining the purpose and means of processing the data alone or jointly with other. So if who is controller, who determines the purpose and means of data, how the data has to be collected, how the data has to be stored, and what are the measures which are which we have to take on the data is what if, if, a, if a person or if a company is doing that, then that will be termed as controller. Now the processor. So any entity who are processing personal data on the behalf of the controller. So basically what controllers do, controller actually hires a processor or controller actually takes help of some other company, some other person to do their work. So controller only determine how to um, execute transaction with the data or how to do the work. So the processor have to do the work according to the instructions of the controller. So processor is basically any entity who are processing the personal data on the behalf of controller is known as processor. Recipient, now uh, this uh, these definitions are really easy. So I'm uh, moving a little fast. Please <laughs> understand that. Recipient is entity receiving personal data, excluding public authorities for specific inquiries. Third party means entity authorized to process personal data other than data subject, controller, and processor. So look, controller, processor, data subject are three parties, okay? Other than that are the third parties, okay? Consent. Consent we'll read very detailed in the coming uh, minutes, but consent should be freely given. It should not be, uh, you know, by undue influence. It, it should not be by coercion. 
a law student should understand that so it should be very freely given specific the consent should be very specific that okay i am giving consent for that purpose only apart from that i am not giving consent so do not process my data apart from which i have given consent it should be very specific in nature it should be informed that a company who is processing my data should inform me in advance that okay chalani i am going to process your data for that purpose and for that only purpose you are giving me the consent so it should be very informed nature and unambiguous indication of the data subject's wishes so anything which is ambiguous so for example i have said i can give my data but i am not sure so this is the unambiguous indication and it should not be uh, you know meant as meant as freely given consent it would always be termed as unambiguous indication of the data subject's wishes so this is not the good good consent and this is not the valid consent as well now personal data breach personal data breach means leakages of personal data so security breach which leads to any accidental or unlawful loss or access uh, has been uh, taken by another person or disclosure of the personal data so anything related to personal data which is not with the authorized or appropriate authority or person shall be termed as personal data breach now genetic data so any data any personal data which reveals the genetic characteristics of a person genetic characteristics are inherited or acquired genetic characteristics of a natural person for example dna it is the is our genetic data now what is biometric data biometric data is personal data relating to psychological behavioral or physical characteristics is known as biometric data these are all very sensitive data by the way now data concerning health so any data which is related to physical health or mental health would be data concerning health now main establishment so central administrative location for controller or processor with multiple eu establishment is the main establishment it means that there are a lot of establishment in the european union okay for the one company but there is one establishment which is known as central administration or we can say in our words which are headquarter so any headquarter would be termed as main establishment now representative we'll read it in the articles as well but any eu based person who are designated to represent the controller or processor so if in case the controller or processor is not in the european union and they have to appoint the representative which will be representing same as the controller and processor would be termed as representative now the enterprise so any entity which is engaged in economic activity you know earning money and all money and stuff so it is known as enterprise now group of undertaking is controlling or controlled entities engaged in economic activity it is matlab enterprise and then group of undertakings you understand enterprise is one company and the group will be known as the one or more company is known as group of undertakings now binding corporate rules we we are going to study binding corporate rule very detailed in our coming uh, in our coming session so any internal data protection rule for cross border transfers within a group corporate group we'll study it it is actually a transfer mechanism how to transfer personal data and it is actually approved mechanism which is known as bcr binding corporate rules now supervisory authority independent public authority overseeing compliance with the regulation for example in india we have high courts in india we have supreme courts so in bureau for gdpr we have supervisory authority it is a court now cross border processing is known as which processing which involves establishment in the multiple eu states or affecting data subjects across the states so cross border processing means a controller or processor is established in one state and the data subject is being established in the other state or the data is being transferred from one state to another then it will be known as cross border processing information society services the this service is basically if you want to know deeply about the information society services because this word is being used uh, many times in this regulation you can refer directive 2015/1535 you can write it down it is directive 2015/1535 so information society services is actually online gaming services you know online online gaming clash of clans pirates of caribia maybe yeah so these kind of games games thing and online gaming services are the information society services international organization are organization which are governed by the international law established by agreement between the countries so this is known as international organization uh, this is the crux of the definition i have covered all the definitions all the 26 definition but you have to read it by your own to understand the deeper understanding if you have any doubt you can clear it from me okay 
now we are moving towards the article number 5 which is the principles of the personal principles relating to processing of personal data very important look article number 5 and article number 6 are the two articles which are the reason why most companies are getting fines in terms of gdpr because it is the principles it is the main fundamental principles of the gdpr what it says it says that all the personal data which are processing by the company which are processing by the controller or the processor they have to adhere to these six principles there are six principles and one more principle which we actually treat it as principle but it has been given as 452 which is accountability so currently we can say that there are seven principles but yes 6 plus 1 so number one principle is lawfulness fairness and transparency so the data should be processed in such a manner that it should be very lawful you know we have to process the data being within the edges of the law only it should be processed in a fair manner means it should be known by the controller it should be known by the data subject both we shall not hide anything from the data subject otherwise we will incur penalty from in our company okay and it shall also be uh, processed in a transparent manner number second is purpose limitation only collect only store only process that personal data which is being used or which is uh, you know which we have used it should be very purpose specific if you are processing some data then you should have the purpose written well in advance that okay this is the purpose why i am processing this data personal data should be collected for very specified things if we have specified we have a written document that okay this for this purpose only we are processing our data very explicit and legitimate purpose and it should not be processed in the manner which is incompatible with the purpose so for example i'll give you one example for that i uh, have collected the data to do the kyc of people okay now my kyc has been completed and i have completed the kyc process now i cannot use that data that aadhar card data that pan card data for some other purpose without informing the data subject otherwise what i'll say otherwise what it will be that it will not be compatible with the purpose so it will be treated as incompatible with the purpose and hence the article number 5 would be breached in that case okay now if further processing uh, we are doing for archiving purpose in public interest in scientific historical purposes then it is possible and then it is permissible that okay we can process that data now the third is data minimization data whatever we have collected we should collect is very minimal in nature means whatever is needed we shall only collect that and the personal data should be very adequate relevant and limited to what is necessary in relation to the purpose of the data process which should be you know for understanding this principle only this article number 5 only you should think that only collect data what is necessary and for the purpose fulfillment otherwise do not collect it otherwise do not store it or do not do any kind of processing on it this is the basic crux of this article moving towards accuracy so personal data should be accurate and necessary and kept up to date it should be up to date for example i have changed my phone number okay and i have informed the company that i have changed my phone number now if the company has not updated their records it shall not be up to date data and they may incur penalty for that as well okay and steps should be taken by the company to erase or to rectify the data which is inaccurate or which is wrong without any delay in this thing uh, the gdpr does not provided or does not provide any timeline because it is very sensitive in nature as and when you receive the information that okay the data has been uh, the purpose has been fulfilled or we have to rectify the data then we have to take the step as soon as possible now storage limitation personal data should be kept in such a form which permits the identification of the data subject for no longer than necessary for the purpose for which data is being stored look i am telling you from uh, uh, from this article only that only for the purpose so storage limitation also saying that on, until the purpose is fulfilled you have to store the data and after the purpose fulfillment you have to delete or erase the data or you can also apply some security measures upon that then uh, we will uh, we are going to read and study abhi uh, in in some in some minutes so the next would be integrity and confidentiality this says that the personal data must be processed in a manner which ensures that appropriate security 
including the protection against the unauthorized or unlawful processing, which is against the accidental loss, destruction and damage, and the technical and organizational measures according to this article number 32, which we are going to study, should be implemented to ensure that the data is being stored or processed within the terms of integrity and confidentiality. Now, the 5.2 says accountability, which says that the controller shall be responsible for ensuring compliance with the principles. In the GDPR, the all the uh, responsibility, I would say, is on the controller. In few cases, the processors would be responsible, which we are going to study, but the accountability is also on the controller to ensure the compliance with the GDPR. And controller should be able to demonstrate that compliance with this GDPR principle requirement has been complied with. He has to make it sure. Okay. So this is what about the control, uh, the accountability principle. Moving forward, we are going to read the article number six, which is the lawfulness of processing. So there are six bases, which is the lawfulness of processing provided in the GDPR. So any company and every company, wherever they are processing the personal data, have to comply at least one of the lawful bases at least one of those six lawful bases. What are the six lawful bases? This is consent, performance of contract, legal obligation, vital interest, public interest, or legitimate interest. So what it says, that consent. If the data subject has provided explicit consent for the processing of data, then it is lawful. If we are processing the data for the performance of contract, means the contract has been executed between the data subject and the controller, then it would be treated as lawful basis of processing and we can process the data number third is legal obligation if our uh, court if our legal authority if any uh, you know government provides to process that data then also it will be treated as lawful basis third is uh, fourth is vital interest means vital interest means which is related to uh, life and death situation of a person so if the processing of personal data is so important that it have to be come under the vital interest to save a person for example, a person is fainted and we have to, you know, process the data. For example, we have to take out the Aadhaar card or take out the card of a person where the name is written, where the phone number is written and we have to call the person emergency contact. Then it will come under the vital interest. What is public interest task, which is known as the personal data processing is very important that it is important in public interest. For example, the, the, the pandemic, uh, pandemic situation arises. So it is in the public interest that okay we have to process the data otherwise government has taken a lot of personal data in the, uh, when the covid happens right so it all comes under the public interest and vital interest so in that case also the uh, processing is lawful and then the legitimate interest legitimate interest is when the company can prove that okay this processing of personal data is important for us to process and to save a person or to uh, you know to legitimize this uh, processing then it comes under the a legitimate interest and then we can process the data for each and everything i uh, i am giving you one short trick that for companies anything if they are processing the data of employees it all comes under the legitimate interest and they can process it so uh, if we want to you know uh, we have to actually prove when we are working in a company we have to prove that okay in what capacity we are processing the data what is the lawful basis so many a times we come across this legitimate interest thing and uh, that's how we process the data article number seven is the condition for consent so uh, in article number six one we have read consent which says that uh, which which clarifies in article number seven is that the consent shall be freely given it should be very clear and affirmative in nature and it shall be easy to withdraw as well means it should be freely given my means i should not be under any undue influence or any coercion that okay i have to give my consent it should not be that manner it should be like that i am freely giving consent to someone okay number second is that i have to say it out clearly or i have to sign it somewhere i have to opt in check in okay i am giving the consent the as soon as uh, it is saying that that okay consent is very easily to is easy to give and the consent shall also be very easy to withdraw. I can withdraw my consent anytime, whenever I think. So there is nothing like, okay, they are processing my data. Shall I withdraw my consent or not? So it is not the case. As a data subject, I have right to withdraw my consent anytime. And they have to stop my processing. Like the controller and processor have to stop my processing in that case.
moving on to article number 8 article number 8 concerns about children's consent so uh, in india the age is 18 years the minors age is 18 years but in europe it is 16 so any data any personal data which is belonging to a minor which is under 16 person who use some online services for example you know the online gaming websites or any other website then what is required that we have to take parents or guardians express consent means consent means the same which we have discussed it should be freely given it should be unambiguous it should be easily given easy, easy to withdraw these things will apply here as well and the uh, it should be taken reasonable steps to confirm that it is actually the parent and guardian who has consented on their behalf it should not be like sibling who has been consented or who is consenting for the minor uh, the consent should take reasonable steps to check the identity of the parent or the guardian or uh, in that case i have written this for clarification that information society services is the online services example applications website games streaming services etc i hope uh, i am uh, uh, a good with that and you all are understanding it uh, moving towards article number 9 important article very important and very important from the perspective of interview as well people do ask it that uh, what is article what is the special category of personal data so in gdpr the special category of personal data is being defined which is any data which is related to racial ethnic characteristics of a person political views of a person religious be beliefs of a person uh, his sex life his sexual orientation genetic or biometric related data health related data or any trade union membership related data would come under the uh, sensitive data and has to be treated uh, very sensitively okay have to be treated where we have to apply uh, some good security measures on the special category of data now uh, you may process personal uh, category of uh, data under very specific circumstances where if you have taken the explicit consent of a person and the purpose has been specifically described only for that purpose you have to uh, basically process the personal data and then if the person's life is at risk you know at any given point in the gdpr if it falls under the vital interest or public interest or scientific nature archival nature historical nature then it's always exempt it's the <laughs> one exception which we have to follow in gdpr and any not for profit organization or any charitable institution also can process data in their legitimate interest even if it is a special category you know it 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 all which i am telling you is the exception okay so how the non profit profit organization and the charitable organization can process the data if they can prove that okay they are processing it for some legitimate interest all right very important article you have to keep it in mind that what is the special category of data and what is not because it is at times confusing moving ahead with the article number 10 which is uh, processing of personal data related to criminal conventions and offences so look criminal conventions and offences related data is generally being processed by the government okay so generally companies private companies the controllers the processors are prohibited from uh, processing any criminal nature data criminal conventions of data unless they can be carried out by some official authority authorized by eu member state and appropriate safeguards are to be given to the data subject so everything and anything for which we are uh, uh, we are processing some sensitive data criminal convention child related data have to be backed in by this safeguards appropriate safeguards so generally all the data has to be backed in by the appropriate safeguards adequacy decisions etc which we are going to discuss later but for any data which is extra sensitive in nature have to have appropriate safeguards into place okay now moving uh, moving towards article number 11 which says that processing which does not require identification now in article number 5 and in article number 6 we have already discussed that we only have to process the data which is very specific to the purpose okay so what it says that article number 11 what it says that the controller does not need to process any additional information related to identity of the data subject if the purpose does not require such identification means do not take extra information from the data subject you need not any additional information from the data subject just for the sake of um, you know taking it and complying it complying with your work it should not be uh, done and it is not good as well you only collect that data which is very 
limited to the purpose. Now, if the controller cannot or is not able to determine uh, that um, uh, that identity of the data subject he is unable to determine maybe he is not able to identify the data subject okay uh, by the name or by the photograph then in that case controller can say that he does not have any info enough information about the data subject and that's why he is not able to do that particular processing and ask for the extra information from the data subject and then the data subject have to provide if he is willing he or she is willing to provide i hope it is clear until now we have just studied principles only and uh, if i tell you the crux because you know it can become a very uh, burdensome to you as well to read the whole gdpr but if i can tell you the crux is that the data subject is the um, is the king okay and they have to determine and they are they they are basically uh, responsible that okay if they do not want their processing or they do not want their data to be processed then they can say it no okay and the controller and processor only have to uh, process data if they have uh, if they have followed the principles if they have followed the lawful basis and if they have the appropriate safeguards related to the data now we are uh, moving towards the chapter number 3 which is uh, rights of the data subject now data subject is it's the same which i have told you that okay natural person me you are all data subject whose data is being processed rights of the data subject are given in article number uh, are given from article number 12 to article number 23 now we are going to read it so article number 12 is uh, basically says the transparent information communication and modalities of the exercise of the data subject so what it says that gdpr requires that data controller to provide information to the data subject relating to processing of their data in uh, how uh, in what manner the data shall be provided in very concise manner means short 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 data very transparent that okay for the for what purpose i have collected the data it should be processed in that manner only easy to access means the data subject can easily access that data and uh, the data has to be uh, processed in very clear and plain language means the data subject should understand the purpose at least if i am uh, making a privacy policy of my company okay i am just giving an example if i am uh, making a privacy policy of my company which is visible on the website okay and i have written a lot of legal jargons in it and you guys are not able to understand any any word okay and you are just googling it okay okay what is the meaning of this what is the meaning of that is that good way to write a privacy policy or will the law approve it no it it will not because the privacy policy should also be written in such a manner that it is easily understandable clear and plain language very transparent in nature it should convey the purpose basically so that uh, this is what it means now if i am the data subject and i have asked for uh, any information from the controller from the processor means a company per se then what is the time period the uh, time period is within one month means within 30 days the company has to provide me the information the controller or the processor has to provide me the information or the uh, the same time period has to be extended can be extended by way of 3 months but we have to give proper reasons for that that okay this is the reason of the delay and uh, i have to provide the information to the data subject in a free of charge manner means i should not charge any any uh, any penny for it but Uh, and uh, but if in case uh, the data subject is you know asking again and again and if uh, i am incurring some cost which is out of pocket then i can charge for some reasonable administrative expenses reasonable charges i can ask and i can also say no to the data subject where the data subject is actually asking uh, for some manifestly found or excessive request if the data subject is requesting very much he is basically you know some script has been some script has been um, undertaken and i am getting a lot of emails then in that case i can just you know just say refuse to give the data or refuse to uh, you know uh, serve that data subject in that manner okay moving on to article number 13 which says that information to be provided where personal data are collected from the data subject now this is uh, where we are actually starting uh, our uh, pointers discussion and uh, it says that what is the information if if the data subject is being asked is is asking me uh, from some information then what is the information uh, where personal uh, data where which which i have collected from the data subject then what is the information i have to provide okay all right 
so this basically outlines that when collecting any personal data directly from the data subject article number 13 and article number 14 i'm going to read it together okay and we both we actually we are reading, going to read it together article number 13 says where the data is being collected directly from the data subject and article number 14 talks about where the personal data is collected indirectly from the data subject means not from the data subject so all of the pointers are same there is just one difference in article number 13 and article number 14 which i'm going to discuss when i'll be reading article number 14 okay so what article number 13 says that the data controller when collecting any personal data directly from the data subject they have to ensure that the uh, information shall be very transparent and very fair number one thing what they have to tell they have to tell the identity and the contact detail of the controller or the controller's representative if they have appointed one Number second, they have to tell the contact detail of the data protection officer of the company. For example, if uh, the data subject have to, uh, you know, contact some DPO, then they have to tell the contact detail of the DPO. The purpose and legal basis of the processing of personal data, why they are processing the personal data, it is very important. Otherwise, fine can be incurred. Then the, le then the legitimate interest pursued by the controller or the third party, if the processing is based on interest. So, it legitimate interest is the lawful basis. You remember now? Law of legitimate interest. So if in if any legitimate interest is there, then you have to tell that as well. Then who are the recipients? If I'm going to transfer the data of the data subject to some other person, to some other company, then we have to tell that, okay, these are the recipients and these are the category of the recipients of your personal data. And you have to give uh, and you have to give the names and uh, the contact details. And if I am being intended to transfer that data to some third country, then I also have to tell such intention of transfer of data to third countries or any international organization. Additionally, for transparency thing, I have to give the storage period of the personal data or the criteria which I have used to determine the storage period. For example, I am I, I am giving my data to some company like Go Ibibo, okay, and uh, they are saying that I'll store your data for infinite purpose or I will store your data for 10 years, then they have to tell me the reason that, okay, why they have selected it for 10 years, why they are saying that we have to store your data indefinitely. And if I'm not agreeing with it, then I can also, you know, uh, put in my point there. So storage period works like that. Then uh, they also have to tell me the, the rights of the data subject, for example, right to access, right to erasure, right to rectification, or uh, right to data portability, or right to object. So the controller processor has to give me the right of, uh, has to tell me that what are the rights which are available. Now, they also have to give me the right to withdraw the consent. So they have to tell me very clearly in bold letters that, okay, I can withdraw my consent whenever I want. It is not their data, it is my data, and I can withdraw it whenever I want it, okay? Very clearly, all right. They also have to give right to lodge a complaint with the supervisory authority. It shall be written that, okay, if in case um, we are not going to, uh, we are not uh, processing your data as for the purpose, or as we told, then you can anytime go to supervisory authority. If it is your data king, you can go. So they have to tell that, okay, this is the supervisory authority where you can go. Now, uh, they also have to tell that if they are processing the data for some statutory or some contractual requirement, and they have to tell that what are the consequences if I do not provide my data. So, for example, some court has uh, given the authority to the company to collect the data from certain data subjects. Okay. Now the company, now the company is collecting that data from the data subject. So they have to tell it clearly that, okay, this is the statutory and legal requirement why they have approached approached me and there will be few consequences if I do not provide the data. So they have to tell it very clearly. And they also have to tell if uh, they are performing my data through some automated decision making, they are making some profiling on my data, then also they have to provide me uh, this, this thing that, okay, we are processing your data for some automated decision making, it shall also be clearly written. Now, if the country, if the controller intends to uh, process data for some other purpose, okay, which is not initially disclosed, so additional information also may, may also be required from the data subject. So they also have to provide me that additional purpose, and it is my wish, my means data subject's wish, that if I want to uh, give the additional information or not. However, these all the requirements does not apply. Means the controller 
uh, should not provide any such identity and contact detail of controller, contact details of DPO, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, if I already know of this information, okay, means the controller is not responsible or should not provide it again and again. If I if I have it once, then it's okay. Now moving on to Article Number Fourteen, wherein I told you that I'll tell you one point which is extra in Article Number Fourteen, and otherwise all of the points are similar. It is uh, Article Number Fourteen basically talks about where the data is being uh, is not collected directly; it is collected from somewhere else. Okay, it means the third party. So in that case, controller shall also tell the source of the personal data origination. Okay, in the in Article Number Thirteen, we have collected data directly from the data subject. Then we should not need to tell the source but if we have collected it from somewhere else then we have to tell that okay from there we have to we have collected your data in that case i can also uh, give you one thing that we got a lot of calls from a lot of uh, companies that okay please buy some loan please uh, you know buy some property then we we can ask them or we can mail them that what is the source where from where you have taken our data and please delete our data please erase our data so this we can do okay now the controller must provide within a reasonable period but not later than one month i have already told you that there is one month period so uh, that uh, after obtaining personal data they have to tell that uh, for example i have exercised my right then controller has to tell uh, or controller has to fulfill that uh, that my right within one month from the request and uh, at least at the time of first communication and first disclose to another recipient now if the controller wants to process data for some other purpose or some other relevant information is required then also they have to ask it from me exception are the, if, the, if the data subject is already having the information means if i already have such information then that uh, uh, all of the above pointers would not apply if providing such information would uh, involve disproportionate efforts matlab uh, a lot of efforts are being involved or it is uh, it is uh, basically in the public interest or uh, it is in the uh, it is for the research purpose that we have collected the data then also it is not required to tell the data subject that okay this is for this purpose we are collecting your data if it is for research purpose or if the union or member state means if the legal authority has basically asked for it then also we have we do not have to inform the data subject okay in all of the things data subject rights we have to ensure transparency very uh, simple but things uh, which we should keep in our mind while reading gdpr moving towards article number 13 article number 15 in article number 13 14 we are, it is just similar directly and indirectly wala thing tha now in article number 15 it is it basically says right of access by the data subject now data subject means me just take the example data subject is shalini i have the right to know Uh, where my data is being processed i have the right to know if i have the access to data and how i can access my data so means data subject is having right to know where their personal data is being processed and whether their data is being processed and if i i have the right to access my data or not now the uh, uh, upon request for example i have requested the controller that okay please provide details about my data then controller should provide the purpose of the processing why they are pro processing my data categories of the personal data involved uh, what what data they have collected and what data they are using for what purpose they have to basically tell me uh, about this and then recipient and categories of recipient including third countries for example they are transferring my data so Or to some other country, or to some other controller, or to some other processor, then they have to tell me about that. Then the storage period, they have to tell me. They have to tell me the rights. Means I have the right to rectify, erase, um, erase uh, data portability. A lot of rights which we are going to study. They have to tell me, and they also have to tell me that I have the right to lodge the complaint with the supervisory authority. And they have to tell me that they are processing my data through some automated decision making, or they are basically performing profiling onto my personal data. These all things we have already read. Look, these all points are repetitive, but we have to understand that in case of direct uh, taking of data, in case of indirect taking of data, and in case of right of access of data, what is the logical thing which is involved? Like you know, while reading GDPR, you should be very logical, and whole GDPR is logical only. 
it it is just it just makes so so much sense to me why this gdpr has been come into place why all of the points are there if some point is not there why this point is not there if you understand the logic behind these points now you do not have to learn or you do not have to remember these points i would say all right uh, now uh, regarding the data transfer uh, they have to in right of access also the uh, the controller has to provide that if the personal data is transferred to the third country or the international organization then the data subject has right to know that there are safeguards in place for such personal data so for example uh, there is some transfer is being taken place by the controller then the data subject uh, should uh, tell that uh, okay we are transferring your data and uh, you should not basically use uh, that we are transferring that is sorry i am getting some messages and or distracting one second one second guys uh mm -hmm. all right so uh, i hope the slides are visible to you i was getting a message from my team that slides are not visible we are on article number 15 all right it should be very much visible to you okay okay so now moving moving towards it i am on article number 15 guys if 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 anyone is losing any uh, any sort of this i hope you are visible okay now article number 15 mein we have studied the, what is the information that should be provided by the controller and uh, in case the controller is transferring the data from one country to another then also they have to tell the uh, data subject that okay we are transferring your data and the data subject has has the right to know that what are the safeguards they are taking place so in the in the coming minutes now we are going to study that what is the safeguards of the transferring of data so uh, that the controller shall also be telling that what are the safeguards uh, he is taking place for example scc is pcr i am going to tell you all and i am the data subject i can ask for copy any time the data um, controller has to provide me the copy within 30 days extendable by 3 months i hope you all are just now you know with with me so the controller must provide the copy of the personal data which is undergoing processing additional copies i can also ask but they can charge the controller can charge some reasonable fee or administrative cost and information should be provided in a very commonly used electronic format it should not be in some format uh, which is very you know very tough to uh, basically open it or i have to encrypt decrypt something it should not be like it is very easy easy peasy thing is this gdpr so if it is made electronically then it should be in the electronic format otherwise uh, or otherwise i specified by the data subject so for example i have specified that okay i am providing you the pen drive please give me the data into that pen drive then the controller has to give me the data in the pen drive okay now um, the data should be provided and one thing is very important while um uh, you should also think as a privacy professional if you are catering the request of one data subject it should not be done any way it should it is not acceptable that while you are providing information to one data subject you cannot infringe upon the right and freedom of other data subjects you should protect the right and freedom of other data subject this is very logical very humanly but yes it is also written in law that it shall not be provided in such a manner that it is infringing the rights and freedom of the data subject all right moving towards the article number 16 which is right to rectification as a data subject i am the data subject we are taking example of me only so for right to rectification shalini has the right if for example i have told you that i have updated my phone number then i have the right that i can ask company to update my phone number and they have to update it without undue delay so data subject have right to promptly correct any inaccurate personal data held by the controller for example they have my wrong phone number now they have to get it rectified now if they have my incomplete data incomplete personal data for example um what what we can take as an example incomplete means okay i was studying that period of time where the company has my data now i am a qualified lawyer or now i am a cipp qualified and if i want to update my records uh, to the company that okay you have to complete my personal data that this is what i am i am i have become now then they have to 
also update it if it is considering with my purpose okay i should not give the data excessively na as well i should also understand the rights according to the gdpr as a as a data subject and um, i can also you know add some supplementary statement i said i can also give some supplementary statement to the controller and they have to consider it i hope so uh, it is clear up till now now we are moving towards article number 17 which is right to erasure it is also known as right to be forgotten so anyone who is appearing for cippe anyone who is uh, doing uh, any sort of search certification this is the easiest question and the most asked question which is what is the another name for the right of erasure which is known as right to be forgotten anyway you can also you know enroll for our uh, classes which is going on for cipm and cippe we are going to share the link of the whatsapp group in our uh, in this in this chat box i request my team members to please share the link and so that people can enroll people can come in there we actually solve a lot of queries a lot of uh, practical queries related to controller processor data subjects uh, in our day to day lives in that group apart from that you can also enroll for some cip and cip courses which uh, is being launched by ministry of security and uh, you can take the benefit of that anyway enough of marketing moving on to the right of erasure or right to forget them data subject have the right to request the deletion of their personal data from the controller without undue delay now if i want my data to be deleted if i want my data to be erased then i can ask the controller and the controller has to delete the data without undue delay okay the controller must erase the personal data promptly promptly means no timeline has been provided in gdpr that you have 30 days no 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 you do not have 30 days you have to delete the data as and when you receive the request okay now what are the other grounds for example i have not requested means shalini has not requested for deletion of data for erasure of data what are the other measures where the controller can exercise this this right number one point is when the data is no longer necessary for the purpose the way they was collected so if the purpose is fulfilled controller has to delete the data if i have withdrawn my consent it is a legal basis if i have withdrawn my consent and no other legal right is exist for such processing then also the controller has to withdraw or the controller has to delete or erase the data okay the data subject ob ob uh, objects to the processing for example i have objected to the processing that the company is not uh, processing my data in the legitimate interest or they are overriding the legitimate then i can also ask or if the company itself thinks if the controller itself think that okay i am processing this data not in the which is not in the six lawful basis then also they can delete the data or erase the data in the gdpr terminology if the data is being processed unlawfully if uh, the company is processing data which uh, is unlawful in nature then also they have to delete the data and uh, erasure is required to comply with the legal obligation under the union and member state law so for example you know like in likewise in our india we have a lot of amendments in the laws currently also a lot of amendments are going on and rules and all are, we are waiting and all okay so like the same thing in europe union and member state law may uh, change the law sometimes and if they require some data to be erased for example if i take okay i am taking one example pandemic was everywhere okay covid covid was everywhere so now since the pandemic has been stopped and now the company wants that okay delete the data for every for every employee or for every person who were covid affected now this is from the union uh, law minister uh, member state so every company have to follow that irrespective of if data subject wanted or not if the if if i am if i for example shalini does not want my data to be deleted like that but if the union has said it then you have to delete it very simple example all right moving ahead if the controller has made the public data public they must inform other controller or processor to erase that data or link of copies for example um, one company has made some data public of a data subject and now the data subject want that data to be deleted from everywhere now the controller who has made the data public or who has transferred or shared the data to some place to some uh, to someone they have to request each and every one to delete the data from there okay 
However, there are exceptions to this because sometimes it is not possible now. Sometimes it is not possible to delete the data from everywhere. So GDPR has, is very considerate of that and they have provided few exceptions, which is if the data is being collected for the rights and freedoms and expression of the uh, person. So if it is related to some right of freedom or expression, then um, it is not important to delete the data. If uh, the data is being collected for some legal obligation or the data is being collected for some public interest, uh, which is vested in the official authority, then also um, we are not required to delete the data. If the data is being collected for some public health purpose, scientific, historical research, test, statistical purpose, then also uh, not required to delete the data. If the data is being collected for some archiving purposes and public interest, scientific, historical, statistical, you know, everything like that, it all come under exception. Or if the data is being collected for some defending of legal claims, then also we are not required to delete the data. If the data is related to any government, related to research, scientific, historical, then the exception would apply in whole of the GDPR. I told you earlier. It is coming now. Okay. Article number 18, which is right to restriction of processing. Now, Shalini do not want their data to be deleted from one company. What are the other measures I have? I can ask for restriction of processing. I can ask the company to move my data to some archive that put in restriction that you do not, you know, do not even dare to process my data. Do not even dare to touch my data. At the same time, do not delete my data. Store it, but do not touch my data. So data subject have that right as well. So for example, uh, what are the situation? Uh, for example, the accuracy of their personal data is con contested. I do not want my data to be deleted because I want to it. Uh, I want to get it rectified at a very later stage. I do not want to get rectified it right now. So what I'll say, I'll say company to just restrict to the processing up till the day I will tell, tell you that, okay, now rectify my data. So if the accuracy is contested, then um, I am just giving the uh, time to the controller to rectify or verify my accuracy, or I'll tell them that, okay, I'll, I'm going to tell you that, okay, these are the rectifications which you have to make. And then what you have to do, you have to restrict the processing up till then. If the processing is unlawful, but the data subject requests for restrictions rather than erasure, or the, the controller does not need the data for the processing, but the data subject needs it for legal claim. So for example, uh, the controller does not want to store the data because the purpose has been fulfilled, but the data is important or it can be used or it is to be used for some legal claims. Okay for after time after after some time so then also the controller has to put in a restriction onto that data but do not delete the data when the processing is restricted so personal data can only be processed with the data subjects consent or for legal claims to protect another person's right or for important public interest except for storage this is what we have studied okay now the controller must inform the data subject before lifting the restriction for processing. So for example, the company has now decided to process my data for which I have put in restrictions. So they have to inform me or they have to ask me that whether we can process the data or not like that. Okay. So it all depends upon data subject. Data subject is the king. All right. Article number 19. Article number 19 talks about notification obligation regarding the rectification erasure or restriction these are the three rights so when the notification has to be provided so when the controller corrects erase or restricts the processing of data then they must inform each recipient who have received the data unless there is some disproportionate efforts we have already read it right and if requested by data subject the controller must also inform about these recipients so um, for example abc company have given my data to CDR company. Now, if I have asked them to delete the data and if I and I also want that why this ABC company is transferring the data to CDR and what is the name of this company? Then if I ask ABC company, they have to tell me the name that, okay, this is the company where your data we have given. So all of the companies who are selling the data, beware, GDPR or DBDP is coming. All right. Moving ahead with article number 20, which is right to portability. This is also the right to the data subject. 
here we can easily take example of insurance companies think of an insurance company and you so data subject has right to receive the personal data they have provided to the controller means the insurance company in a structured commonly used and machine readable format so for example i want my insurance details in a pdf format pdf format is what is structured commonly used you all know pdf we all know pdf and in a machine readable, readable format i am just giving example of pdf format it can also be in excel it, it can also be in word or it can also be in some other format but uh, it should be uh, commonly used and structured now uh, the they have right basically the data subject has right to transmit these data from one controller to the another so for example i am taking the names so i want my data to be transferred from one uh, bajaj finance company to some other shell life insurance so uh, what i have to do is i have to ask the bajaj finance that okay just transfer my data okay so uh, if the day, if the processing is uh, based uh, if the, if the processing is based on the consent or the contract, then I have to execute or I have to change that contract. Otherwise, if the processing is carried out by automated means, then it can directly be transferred. Otherwise, the, other than that, uh, I can also ask my data from Bajaj Finance that, okay, give it to me and then I'll give it to some other insurance company. One option. Second option is that I can ask that you directly transfer my data. You directly shift my data from one company to another in a very technically feasible manner. So this can also be done that I can ask for it, the direct transmission. And it does not apply to the processing, which is necessary for some public interest or for some official authority. Now, <clears throat> article number 21, which says right to object. Now, uh, I have uh, taken all of the rights. Now, the other rights is the right to object. I can also object to some processing. So what is this? Data subject can object to the processing of the personal data based on ground related to particular situation. For example, profiling and the controller shall stop the processing unless they prove that they have some legitimate grounds which override my interest, which override my request and which is in the rights and freedom of data subject or for some legal claim, defense legal claim or for some, any other legal claim. In that case, they can... Um, you know, uh, they can continue processing my data. Now, for direct marketing purpose, uh, including profiling uh, related to such marketing, data subject can object any time. So, for example, one company is using my data for direct marketing purpose. I have bought one um, uh, one cloth from Reliance Trends, and now Reliance Trends is using my data for direct marketing purpose. They are sending me offers. They are sending me other companies' offers. So, in that case, if I can object and... Um, the purpose is being fulfilled then also i have right to object and they have to stop processing my data they have to delete my data if i ask them now the right to object must be clearly and separately presented to the data subject especially during the first communication so during the first communication when they are collecting my data they have to give me a proper checklist okay i have right to object i have right to access i have right to delete i have right to opt out i have right to withdraw my consent all of these things which i have which we have studied so um and when using online services, uh, right to object is uh, through automated means. Otherwise, we can also give them via paper. And if the personal data is processed for some scientific, historical related purpose, statistical purpose, I don't know why I can't pronounce this statistical purpose. Uh, so data subject can object based on their specific situation, but cannot object if the processing is necessary for the public interest. So in public interest now, it is just its exception. Public interest is exception only. We can uh, stop, uh, you know, anything and everything if it is related to some public interest. Now, moving on to Article Number Twenty Two, which is uh, automated individual decision making, including profiling. Automated means by way of computers, automatic. I am analyzing someone's behavior. I am analyzing someone's performance at work by some automated means. Okay. So that then uh, I am also doing profiling that I am looking at the behavior of a person. How is how the person behaves in morning? How the person behaves in evening? So that is what includes in profiling. So data subject can say no to processing if the decisions is solely based on automated processing, including profiling. I can so I can say no. Uh, if uh, the controller is only going to process my data by way of automated processing. However, there are, an there are exceptions to it, which means that if the um, 
if the data is being processed uh, for performing some contract between the data subject and the controller then i cannot say uh, no then i cannot object because i only have entered into such contract and if it has been authorized by the union and member state law then also and if the data subject has given explicit consent means if i have given explicit consent then also i should uh, ask to, to continue processing however if i have given explicit consent but if i do not want at a later stage or i want to object i want uh, the data to be deleted i can ask for it there is nothing that if i have given explicit consent that they do not delete the data they have to all right moving on to article number 23 which is the last uh, article of this chapter rights of data subject this is restrictions restrictions are basically um, abhi we have studied a lot so restrictions also covers under so what it says that the eu or the member state of the eu can pass laws to restrict the data subjects right so for example they can restrict me they can restrict shalini to exercise my right if the processing should be if the processing is related to some national security reasons uh, for some criminal justice to protect the rights and freedoms of the national person or uh, for uh, you know uh, for any risk to the people's right for statistical purpose archival this and that okay all of these things will cover into the restrictions uh very simple article and very simple chapter but at the same time very important although this chapter number 3 is also important for people who are not at all related with gdpr who do not want any privacy knowledge to be inculcated into them but still watching it so the rights were for you so you basically you can exercise these rights any time if you want moving on to uh, chapter which is the controller and the processor a uh, very important chapter so uh, we are going to read with article number 24 which is the responsibility of the controller controller is the ultimate responsible person if i may take i know it is very burdensome for you but if i can take the example of uh, article number 5 uh, sub article number 2 which is accountability right the sixth uh, principles and then the seventh one is accountability so who is responsible and who is accountable the controller so it is connected with article number 24 here we are reading responsibility of the controller now controller is the only person who is responsible to implement the security measures the technical and organizational measures uh, which shall align with the gdpr principles which we have read article number 5 considering the nature and scope and context of the purpose and the me the measures for example whatever are the security measures or technical and organizational measures they have taken it shall also be regularly reviewed and updated okay it shall be regularly reviewed it should not be like that okay once we have determined the technical and organization measure we should not review or update it no 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 we have to review and update it accordingly uh, the according to the technology now among these measures the technical and organization measure the controller should also adopt the data protection policies which are proposed or which are related to the processing activities and uh, controllers can show compliance with the gdpr uh, by showing that they are complying with the approved code of conduct and certification mechanism so look in uh, for privacy professional very important thing whenever you have to show compliance with the uh, gdpr you have to follow two articles article number 40 and article number 42 which says code of conduct and certification mechanism so code of conduct and certification mechanism are two articles by which you can show that you are compliant with the gdpr okay any other people who are watching uh, for example any company professionals or any uh, company owner watching me uh, you can also ensure that uh, your gdpr professional or you are your privacy consultant should be complying with article number 40 and article number 42 all right moving towards article number 25 which says that data protection by design and by default what it says is that we have to make our policies we have to make our systems in such a way we have to design our systems in such a way that it shall be gdpr compliant and the system should be designed in such a way that by default all of the gdpr principles are being followed in easy and layman terms now we are reading that what it says so by design what it means that controller should use the state of the art technology 
this is the word especially uh, for the information security and the privacy professionals that by design means the controller shall uh, use the state of the art technology which ensures that the data protection is being done by design means we have to consider the cost and we have to implement the technical and organizational measures which we also say terms in our information security language so that by design stage only we have to implement terms uh, for uh, terms are uh, okay i'll explain terms so technical and organizational measures are the security measures if you if if, if someone asks that okay give me the example so it is pseudonymization encryption are the uh, examples that okay we are following with terms such as we have to implement pseudonymization measures encryption method in our company which uphold that the data protection principles are being uh, performed and we are abreast with the data protection principles for example all of the principles if i can recall data minimization lawfulness fairness and transparency uh, purpose limitation storage limitation confidentiality and integrity okay for a privacy professional it should be by heart the article number 5 and article number 6 i always say that this is a very important article and whenever you are performing anything whenever you are working on to something you shall ensure and you shall think in a way that okay i am processing this data in what point it it, it is coming okay in such a way you have to carry on your work from now on now by default means that the controller must ensure that only necessary personal data which is which is very important for the purpose a specific purpose and uh, shall be performed we shall only collect just that data limit the collection on the data that it that only we should collect only that data which is very important for the purpose okay we shall also define the storage duration like uh, till what years uh, on what years we are going to store the data and um, by what means we have to delete the data or encrypt the data anything which we are doing now for compliance we have to show that we are complying with the 40 and 42 which is code of conduct and certification mechanism i hope we are through with it moving towards article number 26 which is joint controllers controller we already understood that the person who determines the means and purpose of the data now what is the joint controller so when there are more than one controller very easy can be understood by the term the joint controller is one or more controller so when multiple controller are determining the uh, purpose of the processing data and methods of the processing data they are considered as the joint controllers and they should there shall be very clearly defined responsibilities very transparently between the com controller because it shall not be the case that okay a is saying that b has done something b is saying that a has done something and we are not able to figure out or the supervisory authority is not able to figure out that who has done something okay and we are not uh, uh, holding any one accountable so this is also very bad so what controllers have to do controllers have to basically determine their roles roles and responsibility very clearly that a is responsible for this a and b is responsible for this and uh, uh, the arrangement matlab the, the the arrangement the controller and processors arrangement should be very clearly outlined their roles and responsibilities and uh, regardless of the arrangement like anything says arrangement data subject can exercise their right against each of the joint controller independently so data subject is of no uh, concern that who is responsible for whom they can exercise their right uh, against each of the joint controller this is the uh, thing that gdpr says moving towards article number uh, 27 so it is also coming in, look this chapter article chapter number 4 is very big article number 24 to article number 43 very big chapter all right article number 27 what it says that representative of the controller or the processor which is not established in the union i mean we are not able to understand anything from this heading i know so what it says is that the controller and processor who are not established in the european union you remember we have studied the territorial scope where it says that if the controller and processor is in the european union the gdpr would apply i hope you remember so if the controller and processor is outside of the european union they should appoint one representative within the union in the in writing okay one representative should be appointed Uh, who shall be uh, living in the union only who shall be from the union only european union i mean 
now this requirement does not apply uh, where uh, we are processing on to some occasional nature or some occasional processing is being taken place or the processing is taken place which does not involve very large scale of processing of sensitive data uh, sensitive data falls under article number 9 or uh, also uh, does not apply uh, where uh, we are processing some criminal data okay or for some rights and freedoms of natural person so basically for that we have to apply we have to appoint the representative and uh, now the representative should be from the local member state only and uh, the data subject whose personal data is processed Uh, connecting there with the territorial scope along with the material scope so what it is saying that the uh, representative should be appointed where they are uh, i hope so <laughs> you can understand look the territorial scope we have already studied the material scope we have already studied in the material scope what we have studied that uh, in the territorial processor is in the eu then the gdpr would apply if the controller and processor is not in the eu but the data subject is in the eu but controller and processor is offer is uh, giving services like offering of goods and services and monitoring the behavior then the gdpr would apply right so the same thing is coming here the representative must be located in the member state where these things are happening what is happening offering of goods and services and monitoring the behavior of the data subject if people are able to understand and if people are able to connect at that level i would say that you are actually taking the benefit of this lecture because if you are not understanding this thing now why the representative we are appointing we are appointing the representative so that they can act on behalf of the controller and processor okay and the supervisory authority and data subject can also contact that representative now the controller and processor is not in the eu but the representative is in the eu so for anything and everything the supervisory authority and data subject contact to the representative only logical all right so and the designation of the uh, representative does not exempt controller or processor from legal action that may be brought to them directly now if i want to sue that controller if i want to sue that processor i can definitely sue that controller and processor irrespective of if they have a representative or not because at the at the end the controller would be responsible processor would only be responsible for the act which is being done processor which is not dedicated delegated by the controller we are going to study it right now but um, this is the general law provisions right the processor would be liable when they have acted uh, more than their capacity or more than their delegation power so then the process will be liable we are moving towards article number 28 gd uh, which talks about processor simple processor only now Uh, i have already told you that processor is the person who acts on behalf of the controller right controller is the person who determines the means and purpose of the process look i remember everything but yes for you it it may be new some people it may be new you can also come at that level no issue i have also read it many times so controller uh, in must ensure that the processor offer the sufficient guarantee to implement gdpr so for example one company who is the controller con con company a is the controller company b is the processor now company a would only would like to um, uh, hire that processor if company b would possess the same security measures what company a would possess only then they can be very secured right so Uh, if the processor also offers the technical and organizational measures for the data protection so processor should ensure that now processor cannot engage another processor without a specific or general written authorization from the controller it is the same thing uh, like subletting of the house the tenant cannot sublet it without uh, taking permission from the landlord same thing processor cannot engage another processor without specific or general written authorization from the controller so there are two authorizations which is one is general written authorization and one is a specific authorization so um, 
So what it says that processing by the processor must be governed by the Contractor Legal Act. Controller and processor should enter into the contract. DPA, SCC, they should enter into these contracts. Only then uh, they, they can be into the binding relationship of the processor and the controller. And the, con and the contract must specify the processing details, including the adherence to the confidentiality and the commitments. And they also uh, assist with the con with the audits and and all. I think the uh, we are still at twenty eight and uh, we are left with a lot of uh, data and just half an hour is left. Anyways, so when the processor engages another processor, they must impose GDPR obligation through some contract or legal act, and they also ensure that the terms has been taken into place. And the initial processor, for example, the processor has appointed another processor, but then also the initial processor would be liable for any subsequent act of the another processor now adherence to the approved code of conduct and certification mechanism everywhere it comes that uh, processor shall be complied with the code of conduct which is given in article number 40 and certification mechanism which is given under number 43 which guarantees that they are sufficiently complied with the provisions now uh, also have to enter in scc and uh, if the processor breaches the gdpr then uh, while determining the purpose and means then you know uh, controller should consider uh, this and the processor would be liable for that i hope so you are through it i think a lot of data has been left and we are short of time i was lost in this anyway article number 29 uh, GDPR processing under the authority of the controller and processor. So the processor and anyone acting on the authority of the controller or processor uh, with access to the personal data may only use that data if it is instructed by the controller. Means they cannot go beyond the instructions of the controller. The processor cannot go beyond the instructions of the controller, or they can go beyond the instruction of the controller if in case the union or member state law mandates it. Article number 30, which says record of processing activity. You have uh, the new privacy professionals have heard ROPA, 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 right? ROPA, what is ROPA? ROPA is record of processing activity. So the controller and processor along with the representative, controller, processor and representative, wherever applicable must maintain the record of processing activity but it shall uh, but who is responsible controller will be responsible for the for maintenance of record of processing activity and record may uh, what is included in the record contact detail of the controller purpose of the processing categories of the data subjects and um, who are the recipients uh, if we are transferring the data then uh, to which country we are transferring the data then the details of the data transfer if we are uh, having some guards of the data then we have to tell that okay these are the safeguards which we are taking place then the time for example, um, uh, we are basically following one month of time to erase the data. Then we have to tell them. And we also have to describe the technical and organizational security measures. Now, the processor's record, uh, what shall be included in the processor's record? So contact details of the processor or categories of the data, details of the data transfer and technological and organizational measures. It shall be in the processor's ROPA. It should be in writing. ROPA shall be in writing. And uh, uh, ROPA shall be very up-to-date and updated and adequate that the supervisory authority that we can uh, any way and any time provide the records to the supervisory authority. All right. And uh, uh, what it says that the uh, where the ROPA does not apply, ROPA does not apply uh, to the organization which is uh, which is having uh, fewer than 250 employees means they have uh, 250 or less employees. And uh, however, uh, if uh, they have even they have uh, 250 or less employees, they have to do ROPA when they are uh, basically processing special data which is an article number nine and for some criminal convention or which is related to right and of data uh, subject and freedom all right article number 31 gdpr cooperation with supervisory authority so the control the processor and where applicable their representative shall cooperate on request with the supervisory authority in the performance of their task very easy just one liner you can understand that now we are moving towards article number 32, which is the security of the processing. I should look at the time first. It is 8.34. OK. We have left with good content. OK, we'll try to cover as much as today. I, I, would, I would love to you know, cover everything. If we can extend this webinar, I don't know. 
anyway article number 32 is uh, related to security of the processing we are actually reading this from a very long time that okay we have to comply with the security of processing right so this is what security of processing is very important article in the information security domain so the controller and processor must implement the technical and organizational measures which ensures that the data security uh, the state of the art of technology, the implementation cost, and the nature of the processing, it shall also be th all be there in the technical and organizational measures. What is the technical and organizational measure? It includes pseudonymization, encryption, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and resilience. If you can say all these words in an interview, the interviewer will just select you. I would, <laughs> anyway, I would not give more keys in this webinar. Uh, okay, so they must also establish in the security of processing what controller have to do. The controller should also establish the processor so that the data can be recovered timely if in case any incident or any breach happens. Company should anytime be very available and very ready in case of any incident, any, any breach happens, no, they should recover the data. The data shall not be lost because data is the oil, okay? And... Uh, the another thing is that security measures should consider the risk. Uh, the security measures should be designed in such a way that we are considering the risk of accidental or unlawful destruction of the data or loss alteration. Anything and everything can happen, you know, in this age. Even the biggest of companies are not able to uh, comply with this and even biggest of the companies are not able to save their data, right? So how can we expect all of the companies to save their data? So in that case, company should be having that indemnification clause, I would say, as a legal professional, that, okay, they have to be there, that, okay, the data can be lost anytime and every, every time. Although we have implemented proper technological measures, but in case of this, this now, in case of any accidental or unlawful destruction, this is the risk. All right. And compliance should also demonstrate in the security of processing. We should demonstrate article number 40 and article number 42, which is the code of conduct and the certification mechanism should be there. Now, anyone with the access to the uh, personal data, sorry, article number 32. Pe hai hum. Okay. So uh, anyone with the access to the personal data under the controller or processor's authority must only process the data based on the instructions of the controller except union or member state law. We have just read it that processor can only process the data on the instruction of the controller. But if the union and member state law wants to process that data, then they can also be processing. I hope so, I'm clear here. Um, can I drink water? Please spare me for some seconds. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Water is very important, by the way. It keeps you hydrated. <laughs> anyway, we are moving towards article number 33, which is notification of personal data breach to the supervisory authority. So uh, uh, whenever any breach happens, we have to notify to the supervisory authority. The controller has to notify to the supervisory authority. So controller should inform to the supervisory authority about the personal data breach without undue delay. But the timeline has been provided that from uh, the minute he has become aware of that data breach, he has to uh, basically notify the supervisory authority within 72 hours of the awareness. Or in case uh, uh, there is any delay in, the, in informing the supervisory authority, the delay has to be accompanied by the reasons. Okay. All right. And the processor should also uh, notify controllers if in case the processor got to know that okay this breach has happened so for processor there is no timeline specified very important point uh, remember it processor does not have any timeline to inform to controller they have to promptly inform they have to promptly notify to controller but controller has the timeline to notify to supervisory authority which is 72 hours from the date of from the uh, moment of becoming aware of such uh, breach all right. Notification to the supervisory authority should incl include details of the breach. Uh, what are the details? Nature of the breach, categories of the data subject, approximate number of the data subject which have been uh, which are affected, or uh, the contact information of the data protection officers, or the likely consequences. What are the consequences of such breach? And what are the measures if it has been taken by the controller? 
and any if any immediate or uh, comprehensive information which is not feasible then it has to be provided in phases and without undue controller shall also maintain documents related to the personal database for any future reference and uh, for also the remedial remedial action which he has taken then also they have to uh, maintain it in document form i hope we are through it right very important section article number 34 which says communication of the data personal data breach to the data subject now uh, you have informed it to supervisory authority you have informed it to controller now you also have to inform it to data subject so the controller must notify the data subjects without undue delay uh, when a personal data breach has occurred which has resulted into high risk and uh, rights and freedom of the natural person so they have to tell it without undue delay the um, information should be in very clear and straightforward because data subjects are laymans okay and they also have to tell the nature of the breach now when when the notification is not required when the controller has taken effective encryption or security measures which has rendered that the data is unintelligible or uh, to the unauthorized person means the security measures have already been adopted and the data is not at the risk then it is not required to tell them now subsequent action for example uh, anything has been taken to eliminate the risk to the rights and data rights and freedoms of the data person data subject and uh, notification to the data subject involve disproportionate effort so for example if the controller says that okay notification to the data subject is very tough it it involves disproportionate efforts and there is no um, and there is some alternative effective measures that i can take then also he is ex exempt from it all right article number 34 is the uh, dpia which is the data protection impact assessment extremely important i would say most important article most important to nahi but yes extremely important article of this so uh, controllers are the responsible in that case i will also be like to remind it about that record and processing activity have to be done by the controller and the processor both but the data protection impact assessment has to be done by the controller only okay so controller must conduct the dpia before the processing of anything which uh, is likely to result into the high risk to the individual's rights and freedoms considering the nature and scope or purpose of the processing so if any um, the processing which we are taking which result into the high risk to the uh, freedom rights and freedom of the data subject then we have to do dpia so now one dpia can cover a similar set of processing activities presenting similar high risk this is the question which i uh, today one friend asked me that how many dpias have to be done so this is very important for the privacy professional that for similar processing activity for example there are there is similar processing activities which has the similar high risk one dpia can do okay and a dpia uh, is a specifically required means where the dpia is very very mandatory is the automated processing where the large scale of processing of special categories of data where we are uh, processing data related to criminal convictions or uh, where uh, the systematic monitoring of the public areas of large scale of data is taking place now supervisory authority can also establish or can release the list of processing activity where the dpia is mandatory and at the same time supervisory authority can also publish the list where the sub, uh, where the dpi exempted okay so both ways supervisory authority is the uh, court na so they can do it anyway they can uh, give the list where it is mandatory and they can give the exemption list as well now what is included in the dpi we have to determine systematic description of the processing activity means purpose what is the legitimate interest what is the lawful basis what is the principle you know article number 5 article number 6 everything have to be there in the dpi now what is the necessity and proportionality of the processing operation uh, we also have to evaluate the risk of the individuals rights and freedoms in the dpi dpi is basically what impact assessment risk we have to find out the risk so we also have to evaluate the risk to the individuals rights and freedoms and the measures which are planned to address the risk including safeguards and the security measures so these things have to be there in dpia compliance with article number 40 and article number 42 which is the code of conduct and certification mechanism simple look i am uh, saying this in a very funny tone because these are repetitive point and if someone wants to go through G gdpr in a crux form they have to do this they have to connect with the articles they have to connect with the uh, with the terminologies that okay this is the terminology which is repetitive in nature only then we can do crux anyway controller should also seek the views of the data subject or their representative where appropriate 
moving uh, towards the article number 37 which says the designation of the dpo now we have to appoint dpo and uh, where the dpo appointment is mandatory where the processing is being carried out by the public authority or the body uh, but it excludes any courts any judicial capacity courts it excludes okay their dpo is not required judges are uh, anyway very good so that's why dpo is not required uh, if the core activities of the controller involves regular and systematic monitoring of the data subject on the large scale, then DPO, uh, then DPO appointment is important. If the core activity involves the uh, large scale processing of data of the special category of data or the data related to criminal conviction, then also DPO is important. Now, um, one DPO can be appointed for the group of undertaking, but the DPO should be easily accessible for each of the establishment. It is very important in India. We have a lot of group of undertaking. So the DPO has to be accessible. Now, what is the qualification? There is no such professional qualification. Like it should, DPO should have professional qualities, expert knowledge of the data protection law and uh, publication of contact details means that we have to publish the uh, contact detail and um, communication details uh, on the websites and to the supervisory authority. You have also seen a lot of uh, like every, every person has given their DPO ID onto the privacy policy, right? Uh, this is how we can connect. Anyway, article number 38, it deals with the position of the DPO. So the controller and the processor must involve DPO in properly and timely in all the matter related to protection of personal data. So what is this that DPO shall not be excluded or DPO should not be, um, you know, uh, DPO is, uh, is a person of a higher authority. So he has to be treated like one. Now, the controller and processor should also provide necessary resources to exercise the services of their DPO nature and access to the personal data and processing operation. And now, DPO is also acting as an independent person. He is not uh, responsible to receive the instructions from anyone, like from controller and processor. And he should always and always reports directly to the higher management level, highest management level, highest one, okay? Means the founder CEO level. Uh, DPA jo data subjects hai, can contact DPO uh, regarding to the issues related to the personal data and he, sh he should be easily accessible to them and the DPO is bound by the secrecy and confidentiality and uh, DPO uh, may undertake any other tasks and duties of the company but the duties and company should not uh, be in conflict of interest. All right. Article number 39 which says task of the data protection officer. So what is the task that is performed by the data protection officer? Uh, it is the that, uh, data protection officer is actually uh, performing as a consultant or the advisor or, uh, of the company. Okay, So he has to inform and advise the controller related to the processing obligation or the applicable data protection law. Uh, DPO shall also be uh, important to monitor the compliance of the GDPR because DPO is appointed for that only, no? So he will uh, also monitor the compliance and uh, other uh, relevant laws. Uh, of the whichever has been uh, uh, inculcated by the member state uh, dpo also advise on the dpia thing that where dpi is required and uh, dpia or dpo shall be the primary contact person for the supervisory authority as well as the data subject and uh, dpo shall also consider the risk associated with the processing operation where there is risk all right uh, moving towards uh, the next article, now I have covered the most important articles of the GDPR and very few left, uh, which I am also covering, don't worry. All right, so article number 40 is related to the code of conduct. We are reading it from very long time, no? code of conduct, code of conduct. So all the regulatory bodies that represent any group or any small or medium sized enterprises has uh, should set out one code of conduct. For example, uh, every company has their code of conduct, have their uh, mission and vision statement. Likewise, they have to have their code of conduct, uh, which help their members to comply with the data protection responsibility. The code must be approved by the supervisory authority. For example, I have formed my company and I want my code of conduct to be such way, uh, ABC but I have to get it approved from the supervisory authority. Only then it will be valid. And article number 41 talks about monitoring of the approved code of conduct. So always it is approved code of conduct. It, it shall not be said as code of conduct because code of conduct is always approved by supervisory authority to be valid. Otherwise it is invalid. All right. So any accredited body, uh, 
uh, can monitor that how well the members or organization comply with the code of conduct so and if the company isn't complying uh, with the code of conduct they have to uh, they can be suspended by the supervisory authority means they cannot process the data okay article number 42 talks about the certification so all the member state should encourage businesses to sign up one voluntary certification scheme that demonstrate the commitment to the eu privacy law okay article number 43 talks about certification bodies so certification body uh, jo, uh, which are referred in article number 42 must be awarded by organization as accredited by the supervisory authority okay so these are the certification body and uh, certification body are accredited by the matlab recognized by the supervisory authority all right now we are moving towards the um, most important part which is the transfer of data look gdpr has few very important parts principles rights transfers um, and uh, the penalty portion okay so we are reading uh, we are on article number 45 uh, which is the which is the adequacy decision so transfer can be on the basis of adequacy decision which says that personal data can be transferred to the third country or any international organization if the european commission has determined that country or organization uh, which ensures the adequate level of protection so basically european commission has determined few countries which follow their security measures which have their appropriate security measure and they have determined that countries of the countries of adequacy decision you can google it who are the countries of adequacy decision you can find a long list there and we can transfer the data in that adequacy decision countries without complying with any other measures which we are discussing okay the decision by the commission does not require any additional authorization because the commission has already determined determined so commission decisions prevails and no no additional authorization required in that case now what are the elements that we consider for adequacy so while considering this adequacy decision no the commission what what the commission has considered look we also have to think uh, in in such a way that we have to think in terms of commission that okay if the commission has done this country as an adequacy decision country what are the things they have taken in uh, taken uh, taken into their mind so what are the things is uh, the rule of law human rights uh, relevant legislation if they have followed data protection rules what they have followed or uh, existence or effectiveness of the independent supervisory authority in that country and uh, the international commitments and obligations regarding the protection of personal data which have been taken by the country these are all the things they have to consider now uh, commission's implementing act so the commission may decide through the implementing act that the third country or the international organization ensures the adequate protection okay the commission has to decide and the act should include the mechanism uh, that they can uh, say that okay we are determining you the country of adequacy decision but you are not forever the country of adequacy decision we will review that we are going to review your security measures we are going to review that okay what are the human rights that you are following we are going to review that uh, how independent your supervisory authorities are so the review can be for at least four years and considering the development of the country so for example india is the uh, developing country they can determine the timeline according to that uh, I hope I am making sense <laughs> to you all because I am running a little fast now. And uh, <clears throat> implementing act, so it also specified that territorial and sectoral uh, application identifies the supervisory authorities if applicable. So, and the commission monitors the ongoing developments in the third countries and international organization that could affect the adequacy decision. So every time commission monitors it, and uh, if the third country or international organization no longer ensures the adequacy protection, adequate protection means they are not uh, liable or they are not capable to be in the adequacy decision country, the commission may repeal amend or suspend that country anyway. All right. <clears throat> uh, article number 46 talks about the transfer subject to appropriate safeguards. There are three things. One is adequacy decision. Second is appropriate safeguards. Third is derogations always remember article number 46 talks about appropriate safeguards so the controller or the processor may transfer personal data from one country to a third country or to an international organization only if appropriate safeguards are provided now we are forgetting that we are not the country of adequacy decision okay so now what we have to do if we are not the country of adequacy decision then we have to follow appropriate safeguards appropriate safeguards are provided in article number 46 okay so uh, enforceable data subject right and effective legal remedies what are the types of appropriate safeguards safeguard can be legally binding and enforceable instruments for example contracts 
we can uh, we can enter into contracts with the um, controller of the processor or uh, between the public authorities or body or uh, we can also enter into binding corporate rules which are giving in uh, which are given in article number 47 or uh, we can also uh, follow the standard data protection clauses adopted by the European Commission or the uh, standard data protection clauses which are up adopted by the supervisory authority but approved by the European Commission. We can also follow the approved code of conduct article number 40 or uh, we can also follow the approved certification mechanism article number 43. Look article number 40 and article number 43 is coming again and again because this is the article by which we can determine the compliance that okay we are compliant with GDPR and we can now transfer the data please do not disturb us. This is the thing. All right, additional safeguards which the supervisory authority um, is required that uh, with the authorization from the competent supervisory authority, we can also enter into the contractual clauses between the controller and the processor and the recipients of the personal data means we can enter into DPAs and, and SCCs and provisions inserted for the administrative arrangements between the public uh, authorities and the consistency mechanism also. Now, Article number 47, which talks about the binding corporate rules. So what is BCR's binding corporate rules? Very tough concept. Uh, not tough, I would say, but very, very tough in terms of practical life. Very, very tough because BCRs have to be approved by the supervisory authority and supervisory authority are not very easy to approve these kind of uh, uh, binding corporate rules, right? So uh, binding corporate rules are basically legally binding and enforceable internal rules and policies for data transfer within the multinational group of companies. So binding corporate rules are only adopted by the multinational companies, which works in such a way that um, that is similar to the internal code of conduct. So they allow multinational companies to transfer their personal data internationally within the same corporate group to countries that do not provide the adequate level of protection of personal data as required under the GDPR. So basically, what are the important takeaways which we can take from the binding corporate rules is that it has to be entered by, uh, by the multinational group of uh, undertaking and it allows transfer within that group of companies uh, it is like an internal code of conduct and uh, it ensures that we are actually complying with the appropriate safeguards okay done yeah so bcrs ensure what what bcrs ensures so bcr ensure that all the data transfer within the corporate group comply with the gdpr it shall contain what bcr should contain bcr should con contain data protection principles for example transparency data quality security tools for effectiveness what are the tools which we are uh, uh, taking for effectiveness elements or clause providing the bcrs are binding and what are the main principles which we have to follow same principle are uh, the principles of article number five transparency fairness uh, lawfulness data minimization purpose limitation storage limitation security and uh, it should also provide guarantee um, uh, regarding the processing of a special category of personal data and the uh, restriction on transfer of onward transfer so for example if i want to transfer from india to australia to spain so it, it shall also contain the provisions for onward transfer all right, uh, now we are moving towards derogation. And uh, derogation, uh, I already told you, na, appropriate uh, adequacy decision, appropriate safeguard, binding corporate rule, and derogations. So this is the last measure. Derogation is basically the exception. So personal data may be transferred to a third country or international organization if these conditions are met. If these conditions are met, we do not have to comply with any other uh, sections, OK? So this is explicit consent. Uh, from the data subject and the data subject are aware about the risk then we can transfer uh, if the transfer is very necessary for the performance of the contract or pre-contractual measures if it is necessary for the interest of the data subject or if it is necessary for public interest if it is necessary for a defense of legal claim or it is for necessary for uh, vital interest protecting the vital interest of the data subject now the additional conditions which are limited to the transfer is that it shall not be repetitive in nature and uh, it should involve very limited number of data subjects or it should uh, be for compelling legitimate interest okay and the controller assess circumstances which are suitable uh, safeguards assess the circumstances and provide suitable safeguards for for transfer and it shall also inform supervisory authority and data subject according to article number 13 and article number 14 we have already read it um Moving on to the last uh, uh, last uh, topic, which is remedies, liabilities, and penalties. Uh, this is the last topic, and uh, every law is just end 
by this thing only ki bhai penalty what is the penalty okay so in this uh, we are covering uh, from article number 77 to article number 84 article number 77 says that uh, we have the right data subject have the right to lodge complaint to the supervisory authority so individuals or data subject can make complaint with their supervisory authority means their member state supervisory authority and so where supervisory authority shall keep the data subject informed supervisory authority shall also have to tell them that okay what is the progress what is the outcome of their complaint okay article number 78 talks about right to effective judicial remedy against a supervisory authority so if a person isn't satisfied with how a supervisory authority handles a case in certain that concerns them so i have come i have done my complaint with supervisory authority and now i am not satisfied uh by the way the supervisory authority has dealt with my complaint so then i can apply to the court i can apply to the judicial court for hearing and uh, this is only applicable when the supervisory authority has given the decision which is binding and the supervisory authority has given the final decision only then in the midway i cannot go to the court i have to wait till the decision comes in. okay now article number 79 which is right to the effective judicial remedy against the controller or processor so if the individual or the data subject feels that okay the controller and the processor has compromised their personal data by violating gdpr means i can see that okay this company is violating the gdpr principle this company is not handling my data properly that i can then i can ask the court to hear this case and um, uh where and where i can go to the court so for example people are not aware that okay which court i have to go so we have to go to the court where the controller of the processor is established means the member state where the controller of the processor is established or where the data subject reside means where for example where i reside i am the data subject so where i reside i have to apply to that court okay article number 80 talks about uh, representative uh, representation of the data subject so any not for profit organization or the charitable institution can support the individual's case against the controller or processor if they have legitimate public interest reason so for example i am uh, a public activist public activist okay and i want uh, and i have seen that okay this company is not following up the gdpr principles properly and i want to complain so uh, in that case i can also take help from the not for profit organization or charitable institution and they can support my case all right article number 81 talks about the suspension of the proceeding so if there are more than one case which is pending against the same data controller or the processor at one time the court hearing the first case first case should notify the second court to suspend the processing proceeding until the first case ends so we are not giving extra burden to the controllers and processors of multiple cases if the one case is pending then the other court can say that okay i am suspending your process proceeding until the first uh, case is properly heard all right article number 82 re related to the rights to compensation or liability so in certain circumstances what happens na data controller and processor financially compensate should financially compensate the individual if in case of gdpr breach or infringement so this is very important if you see any company infringing the gdpr no you just complain that company and get the financial compensation all right companies please <laughs> don't mind uh data processors uh, are only liable so for example data controllers are anyway accountable right but data processor are only liable if they are if they have gone against the expressed instructions of the controller uh, or the or they have breached the gdpr articles uh, which have uh, in uh, which have basically ex exceeded the instructions of the data controller and data controller however uh, liable for whatever damage they are processing cost so basically data controller have to give the damage this is what it says now article number 83 and article number 84 the last few minutes the article number 33 talks about general conditions for imposing administrative fine very important for all the privacy professionals who are going to give interview into any companies this question is uh, every time asked so if the data controller or processor infringes the gdpr regulation the relevant supervisory authority can impose fines very clear if if i have breached something if i have infringed the gdpr then the fine would be incurred so what are the basis uh, on which the fine has to be decided okay how much fine have to be decided decided so the fine have to be decided on the basis of how severe the infringement is okay if the company is intentionally or negligently broke the rules 
or uh, what are the steps or what are the measures the company have taken to mitigate the damage and what is the compliance history like if the company is like that only always um, um, in, always like infringing the GDPR, then we'll put high penalties on that company. And what are the data categories that is affected? So for example, if the sensitive data is affected, then the uh, fine would be very high. And how easily and willingly the data controller is able to um, cooperate with the supervisory authority. This also have to see. So or any other relevant factor, which uh, is decided by the supervisory authority, it is on to the will of the supervisory authority. I cannot say anything on to that. Uh, so there are two categories of fine. Very important. Listen to me carefully. Uh, two categories of fines. One is higher of 2% of the annual global turnover, annual global turnover or 10 million euros for breach related to inappropriate data protection mechanism or failing to take proper consent for children accessing your service. So these are the two examples which I'm giving it to you. So in that case, higher of the fine, 2% of the annual global turnover or 10 million euros, whichever is higher. Okay. Another fine is higher of 4% of the annual global turnover or 20 million euros for fallings, which is related to infringement related to non cooperation with the supervisory authority if i have not cooperated uh, cooperated with the supervisory authority now i'll be you know you know insolvent that way <laughs> and um, if i have also failed to get consent related to the data collection then also i'll be incurring with that fine so it also depends upon the discretion of the supervisory authority or maybe they are having some list related to that but okay this company um, will be getting this much fine and article number 84 talks about the penalties so of member state must draft and implement their own GDPR infringement penalties alongside with these guidelines. So, but they shall not be higher than this, okay? They can draft it. So, member state can draft it. Uh, this is all, uh, this is all which I wanted to share with you today. I hope uh, something uh, or the other you have uh, got from this session. And uh, uh, once again, I have just to stop screen sharing yeah so this is it guys i have uh, yeah i have managed to complete it in two hours and eight minutes i was actually very much um you know tensed by this fact that if i can able to cover the whole thing within two hours or not because i really wanted to make it a very very crash and uh, i think that uh, whoever has uh, listened to this uh, gdpr session very carefully must have gotten some insights uh, must be able to, you know, uh, get the uh, motivation to read the GDPR once and uh, start their uh, journey, uh, privacy professional journey. Uh, this is all with me. I am Shalini uh, signing off. Maybe uh, we'll meet again with some other insightful session uh, in collaboration with Minister of Security. Don't forget to reach me out on LinkedIn. Don't forget to follow Minister of Security's page on LinkedIn. And also don't forget to, you know, uh, follow my, uh, follow our privacy uh, group, wherein we are, we, we basically share a lot of insights with you. We solve your doubts and we are just uh, privacy professionals who are at your service. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for staying up till now for these two hours. Uh, okay, bye.